Phase 3 of construction of the International Space Station advances on this third shuttle assembly mission of the year as six Americans and three Russians join forces to add the first starboard side component of the station's integrated truss structure. The primary objective of this mission is to deliver and install the S-1 truss. Uh, S-1 is a 45-foot long, 30,000-pound uh, structure that houses a, a number of electronics components and primarily a large set of radiators that provide cooling for the uh, um, space station in its finished configuration. So our prime mission is to take this truss up, attach it, and make it functional and ready to go so that you can slowly work on the sections of the truss as you build them out. So that's number A, number one. And number two, we're taking some supplies up to the station guys and bringing some things back as well. And we have about a thousand pounds of equipment that will have to be manually transferred through, uh, through the airlock and into the space station. Um, probably the most important thing that we're carrying and transferring is a series of scientific uh, research experiments that we will bring up and trade out with ones that have uh, completed their research on space station. Also on the transfer list are new components for the American spacesuits on board the station to accommodate spacewalkers Dave Wolf and Piers Sellers. So what we try to do is on every shuttle mission, we perform a rotation of that equipment. In this case, we're actually, we are actually bringing up Dave's EVA suit, but we're not bringing up Piers' suit. We're only bringing up his arms and legs. Uh, the suit is actually designed to be uh, used on station but for one of the station crew members if they need to go EVA. Now, this is the suit dance. It's a real emphasis placed on making sure that the person gets the suit that's the right size, the right gloves, because these are very particular, all the right pieces. And that involves us swapping things out real time. So we'll take the extra large up, whip the arms and legs off it, put them on the large torso that's up there, and I should be ready to go. As Wolf and Sellers get dressed in the Quest airlock, Magnus moves to the Destiny lab to help operate Canadarm2. Ashby takes control of the shuttle cameras to provide good views of the work site, and Melroy gets set to orchestrate the spacewalk. IV-1 is from Melroy, and the second IV crew member, we will have uh, our IV crew members, Pierce and uh, Dave, with this, uh, with yours very um, difficult walk in space, yes. The first spacewalk begins after Magnus and flight engineer Peggy Whitson activate the station's robotic arm which is mounted to the mobile base system so it can move along the truss. They will grapple the S-1 and install it on the starboard end of the S-0. This is the first time we're going to use the arm on the MBS on the S-0 truss and that will be really exciting. Um, we're, it's going to be parked just uh, starboard of the, uh, the lab intersection with S-0 and we're going to, like I said, reach down into the tail of bay and slide it up the tail swing it over and install it. For while we're moving the truss and setting it up for installation, the EVA crew members will actually be in the airlock prepping to go out the door as soon as we get to a certain point in our procedure for the installation. They'll be going out the door so that as soon as we get it installed, they'll be connecting the electrical and thermal uh, connections. Integrating the S-1 truss onto the station is the primary task for this mission. But during their three spacewalks, Wolf and Sellers have several other objectives to complete, one of which is releasing launch restraints on the S-1 radiator beam. It has three radiators on it that are all folded up nice and tight, and they will be deployed when the time comes. On our flight, we're actually going to deploy just the center of the three just to make sure that everything is working okay. We're going to get a little bit of a jump on things to do that. So we're excited about seeing that uh, radiator unfurl out into space. Another spacewalking task is to free up the Crew Equipment and Translation Aid, or CETA cart, one of two hand cars for the station's Space Railroad that will operate alongside the mobile transporter carrying Canadarm2. In general, in general, this is the same MT but just only manual. Uh, we, we will use this one for transportation equipment along the trust. They are also scheduled to install an additional S-band antenna to improve space-to-ground communications, new television cameras on S-1 and the lab module to provide better views of the station's exterior, and a series of plumbing fixtures 
known as spool positioning devices. A lot of the quick disconnects, the little junctions between fluid pipes that carry all the cooling all over the station, these junctions are some are a little suspect, and we're going to put little plumbing fixes on them all, uh, or on a lot of them, not on them all. Um, some 30 odd of these little joints have to be looked at and have a little device clipped on there to make sure they behave themselves when you turn your back on them. After a week of docked operations, Atlantis will undock from the International Space Station, with Melroy flying it around the station for her crewmates to take video and still pictures of its new configuration. The shuttle crew will use some of their time on the way home to gather data for scientists studying the Earth's atmosphere. We will be operating a payload called Shimmer. Its goal is to examine the upper atmosphere for various gas components. It has very sensitive detectors, interferometers inside, which allow us to analyze uh, the components of the upper atmosphere uh, as part of the full understanding of the human impact on our environment. Atlantis is targeted to touch down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to conclude the 11-day mission of the fourth shuttle flight of the year. The International Space Station's integrated truss structure is made up of 11 separate segments that will be assembled together for the first time in orbit. This flight brings the second segment, the S-1. But we have the radiators in S-1, and as you get out to S-6 and P-6, you have solar arrays and things like that. But the whole truss is an important part of the station because one, it supports the solar arrays that lets you um, generate power. Two, it supports the radiators that you that you can bleed heat loads and keep the, ther the equilibrium, thermal equilibrium, um, good for the station. And three, it supports the Canadian uh, arm in the mobile transporter that let that allows the uh, station robotic arm to move around on the station uh, as it rolls up and down the truss. And ultimately, this thing is going to be. 350 foot long truss striking across station with all the solar arrays on the ends and the radiators sticking out the back in the middle. The 350 foot long railway in space is being installed piece by piece. S0, the center segment, arrived earlier this year and the crew of Atlantis is delivering the second truss segment, the S1. It weighs 28,000 pounds and it is the home of the thermal control system for the space station, at least the half of it that goes on the right side. It has thermal radiators which circulate ammonia through them and radiate the heat to space. Then this cooled ammonia goes back to the space station for air conditioning and to cool electronics. It also is a structural member that will hold the, the solar arrays, which will be the next step to add further outboard, and those will generate the electrical power for the space station. Of the various systems and components housed on the S-1 truss segment, the primary element is the starboard side thermal control system, which includes the nitrogen and ammonia tank assemblies, the pump module assembly, and the radiators mounted on the thermal radiator rotary joint. We use uh, ammonia for our cooling system, and so that's a, a very critical part of this radiator assembly is to have the ammonia, the ammonia is what actually transfers the heat. So we have an ammonia tank, a nitrogen tank, which uh, provides the pressure for the ammonia. That's, you know, a little bit of gas to push it down and help it circulate. Uh, and we have many, many of these ammonia lines all over. The pressurized ammonia flows through the pump module assembly to the coolant lines to collect heat from station equipment and carry it to the three radiator panels where the heat is expelled. A thermal radiator rotary joint located on the aft side of the truss, rotates the radiator beam, angling the three radiator panels away from the sun for maximum heat rejection into the coolness of space. Opposite the radiator, on the forward side of the truss, is the crew and equipment translation aid, or CETA cart, which moves along the railway. Uh, the CETA cart is like one of those little rail cars that's manually powered and uh, it allows the spacewalking astronauts to jump on and uh, manually propel themselves and their tools and equipment uh, all the way out the track to the end of the truss. 
There's places to stick tools in it. Um, there's places to tether tools to it all over the place, all kinds of handholds. And for our EVAs, it turns out that we're kind of using it as a home plate. It's home base. If you want to leave a tool somewhere and know exactly where it is, if you need to come back and get it, that's where we're leaving it. So it's, it's where we start and finish almost all of our EVAs. The S-band antenna provides redundant communication capabilities between the station and satellites in a higher orbit. The antenna is installed on the zenith, or top, of the truss. An external television camera group is installed on the nadir side of the truss, providing additional exterior views of the truss structure and the station. On the starboard end of the S1 truss segment is an active segment-to-segment -segment attach system, including four motorized bolt assemblies and a capture latch assembly, or claw. These components will secure the next starboard segment to the S1, the S3 scheduled to arrive on flight 13A next year. The primary focus of this station assembly flight is the installation and activation of the S1 truss segment, doubling the first railroad in space. The first EVA is uh, primarily hooking up electrical connectors that will provide heater power and, and allow S1 to survive in the cold thermal environment of space. And the subsequent two then uh, add to that by uh, attaching fluid uh, connectors, fluid umbilicals, and outfitting different components of the truss. The two spacewalkers are astronauts Piers Sellers and Dave Wolf. Piers has total technical competence. His strength, however, lies in his personality. He's funny, appropriately. He is personable. He'll be a great friend forever. I can think of no one I'd rather share the experience of him doing his first space flight and conducting three spacewalks. Uh, I can't wait to hear what he has to say about that. I've been very, very fortunate, you know, in having David for a partner at just about every level. Um, first thing, he's very, very experienced. He's, you know, had his four and a bit months on Mir. And just as important, he worked in the EVA branch uh, for almost, I think, five years or something, uh, off and on, doing development work. So he's very well versed in all the tools and techniques of EVA. Sellers is on his first space flight. Wolf floated in space in a Russian Orlan suit when he made his first spacewalk on the station near while living there for over four months back in 1997 and 98. The spacewalks are directed from inside the shuttle by pilot Sam Melroy. It's amazing how much um, effort it takes on the part of the IV to try to keep track of what two different people are doing at once task-wise and remembering that they have something else to do, you know, and, and how things, if there's been any problems, how it affects the whole flow. I love it. It's wonderful. It's like being in the mind meld with the, with the two of those guys when they're outside. While Wolf and Sellers are in the Quest airlock preparing to go outside, Expedition 5 Flight Engineer Peggy Whitson and Mission Specialist Sandy Magnus use the station's robotic arm to install the S-1 truss onto the starboard side of S-0. When three of the four automated bolts have been fastened, Wolf and Sellers will open the airlock hatch. The first thing I should see should be the Earth scooting by five miles per second from, from left to right. So I'm hoping they're going to give me a little break there to just get used to the, <laughs> the new perspective. Wolf's first task is to power the S1 truss by connecting it to the S0. There's a, a zenith tray and a nadir tray, just called by their, their physical location on the truss, uh, that have connectors, these power and data connectors. The power and data have to be done right away. The problem is um, you don't, it's sort of like plugging into something into a hot socket. You don't want to do that. So the station actually has to power down everything that goes out to one tray at a time. So you can't do this one right after the other. You can't do one set and the other. It takes time to power up all that equipment and then power down the equipment on the other tray. And while Wolf makes those connections at the Zenith tray, Sellers releases most of the launch locks on the radiator beam that holds the three radiator panels on the aft side of S1. Wolf and Sellers will then work together installing an S-band antenna that will provide additional communication abilities to the International Space Station. This is a, a whopping great antenna. It's the size of, I'm trying to think, 
um, a big file cabinet with a long stand sticking out the bottom. And it's bolted, for launch, it's bolted onto the front of the truss, the big launch restraint bolts. And, uh, but it has, actually ends up sticking out of a position on the top of the truss. So it's pointing away from Earth up at a satellite you know, for communications. The two spacewalkers then activate the crew and equipment translation aid, or CETA cart, on the front face of S-1. It has to be very securely attached, of course, to withstand a shuttle launch, but it essentially floats free on the rails when it's in its activated position on orbit. You should be able to push it with one hand. It weighs over a thousand pounds. It's amazing how strong a person can feel in space while it's paradoxically uh, causing your muscles to waste in, in a medical sense. Using the CETA cart as a temporary stowage location, the astronauts install an external television camera group on the nadir side of S-1 with Wolf making connections to activate the camera. As they do, flight controllers will power up the systems connected to the Zenith tray. If they check out, the nadir tray and its systems will be powered down so sellers can make the final power connections between the station and its newest component, the S-1 truss. The second spacewalk begins with a task added to the mission only months before launch after engineers determined that pressurized ammonia in the station's cooling system could leak into line connectors and prevent them from being disconnected. The solution is to install school positioning devices, or SPDs, on those connectors. The first thing we're going to do is go and look at some of these uh, fluid disconnects that I talked about. And put the hardware on them to make sure that they stay doing what they're supposed to do. So that's pretty much first off. Then the two spacewalkers maneuver inside the truss to work on the ammonia and nitrogen tank assemblies. We will connect ammonia lines for the cooling system of the space station. These are like elephant trunks that uh, carry ammonia from the radiators on the S-1 truss to the rest of the space station to cool equipment. Wolf first makes the ammonia umbilical connections to the station, then connects the nitrogen tank that will pressurize the ammonia so it can circulate through the system. After Wolf translates back to the CETA cart to release the remaining launch bolts and brake systems, he'll connect the CETA cart to the mobile transporter, allowing the two mobile units to move along the track as one. Wolf next retrieves another camera group and hands it to sellers, riding Canadarm2. Sandy Magnus maneuvers sellers to the worksite at the forward end of Detony. And this, this will be on a mast that will stick out sideways from the, the forward end of the lab and there will be a big, big mobile camera group that will um, tilt around and can look at pretty much everything on the starboard side of the station. Wolf then switches places with sellers on the station's robotic arm and rides to the radiator beam to install spool positioning devices and release the final launch lock so ground controllers can rotate the beam and unfurl one of the radiator panels during checkouts the following day. The mission's third excursion outside the International Space Station starts with an inspection of a safing bolt within an interface umbilical assembly. During installation of the S0 truss segment earlier this year, spacewalkers were unable to release this bolt that prevented power and data cables between the S0 and the mobile transporter from accidentally being cut during launch. If spacewalkers Dave Wolf and Pierce Sellers are able to release the bolt, this task will be completed. But if the bolt cannot be released, they'll replace the entire IUA. Wolf disconnects the power and data cables, Sellers removes the old IUA and installs a new assembly, then stows the old one back in the airlock while Wolf reconnects cables to the new interface umbilical assembly. From there, the two will translate over to the S0, S1 fluid jumper launch location. They'll make the connections between the S0 and the S1 installing spool positioning devices on those connectors. Mission controllers on the ground will perform a three-minute leak check prior to the crew members reinstalling thermal covers and moving to the front of the truss to remove keel pins. When the truss is sitting in the payload bay of the orbiter, it's sitting with its, its railway face down. And they have these two huge triangular pieces of uh, structure called keel pins that support the truss to the bottom of the shuttle. Now, obviously, once you've got this thing installed on station, you don't want these things these big uh, keel pins in a way because they'll stop the seat of cart from going up and down. They sit right on the railway track. So we're going to unbolt those. We're not allowed to throw them away. They'll probably 
hit something if we do. They're going to actually take these keel pins off and they're going to tuck them nice and tidy right next to each other, just tucked out of the way on the inside. That'll be fun. Um, I'll be holding one of these things while I'm standing on the arm and Sandy will drive me down the length of the truss. I'll flip it over and stick it in there. Wolf and Sellers will then install spool positioning devices on the thermal radiator rotary joint, which rotates the radiator panels for maximum cooling efficiency. Once that is done, Sellers will reconfigure power connectors on the radiator beam while Wolf crawls out to the far end of the S1 truss to open clamps and prepare the S1 to receive the S3, the next starboard side truss segment scheduled to arrive next year. Go for main engine start. Four, three, two, one. Zero and lift off of Einmal ist es schon Routine. Amerikas Raumtransporter im Pendeldienst ins All. Wenn da nicht die Erinnerung wäre an die Katastrophe von 1986, als die Fähre Challenger beim Start explodierte. Die Entdeckung von feinen Rissen im Treibstoffsystem der Shuttle-Flugzeuge wird deswegen von der NASA sehr ernst genommen. Keine gute Nachricht also vom Kontrollzentrum an die derzeitige Besatzung der Internationalen Raumstation. Die Astronautin Peggy Whitson aus dem All, lakonisch. Vor Dezember werden wir wohl nicht nach Hause kommen. Bei der Inspektion sind die Materialfehler gefunden worden. Ob sie bloß eine Verzögerung oder einen wirklichen Rückschlag bedeuten, ist noch nicht abzusehen. Es hängt vom Umfang der Reparaturarbeiten ab. Möglicherweise existieren die Risse auch schon länger und waren bei den letzten Missionen schon vorhanden. Das wäre ein Fiasko für die angestrebte null risikopolitik der NASA. Die NASA leidet ohnehin bereits unter einem 5 Milliarden Dollar Finanzloch im Haushalt für die nächsten vier Jahre. Der Zeitplan für die ehrgeizigen wissenschaftlichen Arbeiten im Weltraumlabor, die Rechtfertigung für das gesamte Programm, muss gestreckt werden. Gefahr für die Besatzung besteht akut nicht. Im Notfall ist die Raumstation auch mit Hilfe der ehemaligen Konkurrenz zu erreichen. Mit einer russischen Rakete vom Weltraumbahnhof in Kasachstan sind schon mehrfach Kosmonauten in einer Kapsel zur Station befördert worden. Zu den US-Fähren sagt der NASA-Sprecher, ersetzen, reparieren oder fliegen wie bisher. Eine besonders erhellende Antwort auf die Frage, wie es weitergehen soll. In den nächsten Tagen wird jetzt bekannt gegeben werden, welche Auswirkungen die kleinen Risse für das große Abenteuer im Weltall haben werden. The shuttle is now scheduled to lift off Thursday at the earliest, but that's not the only problem facing NASA planners. Well, there's one issue, but there are also concerns about the advanced age of NASA's shuttle fleet. More on this from Miles O'Brien. Something old is nothing new for NASA's manned spaceflight effort. And as Atlantis sits on the pad, poised for the first space shuttle flight in four months, engineers are wondering how old is too old. Just because it's a little old doesn't make it uh, uh, to the point that we should throw it out. It's just reaching the prime of its life. The older I get, the more I appreciate it. NASA's man in charge of the $3 billion shuttle program, Ron Didamore, earned some more gray hair this summer, dealing with a spacecraft designed in the 70s and launch facilities built during the moon race. The first sign of trouble came here, deep in the tangle of wires and pipes inside the aft compartment of Atlantis in June. An eagle-eyed inspector saw this, a crack no bigger than a third of an inch. A small thing, but in a critical spot. The 12-inch pipe that carries liquid hydrogen rocket fuel from the shuttle's big external tank to its main engines. The worst case scenario is that uh, you could continue to crack, break off a piece of the material, but if that material breaks off and gets ingested by the main engine, it could be a bad day, it could be a catastrophic event for us. More inspections ordered. More cracks found, about a dozen in all. The fleet was grounded. We're not going to fly n with something we don't understand, so we are going to take a time out. NASA designed its space shuttles to fly 100 missions each, originally over a 10-year period. But 21 years after the first space shuttle launch, 
The fleet has logged 110 missions total. At that rate, the fleet of four could fly for another 60 years. That may sound far-fetched, but NASA managers are now asking the shuttle program to see what it would take to fly until the year 2020. The report is still in work, as they say in the space business, but the shuttle team will likely push for continued improvements to the avionics, hardier wheels and tires, replacement of old tape data recorders with digital technology, even replacing clunky old circuit boards. Beneath the skin, not your father's space mobile. You cannot replace this vehicle with the exact capabilities that we have and be cost effective at it. But in the space business, even the first step can be daunting. While engineers burned the midnight oil to fix the fuel line cracks, another team found some badly cracked bearings in the 37-year-old crawler that takes a stacked shuttle out to the pad. Time to trade it in? Not a chance. It, too, will be repaired. NASA is inching toward the future on the backs of some vintage gear that, for all its quirks, remains state-of-the-art. Miles O'Brien, CNN, Houston. Well, time now to check in with Jenny Harrison for the Complete American Edition weather forecast. Let me guess where you're going to start. Hey, Jen. Hi there, Jonathan. Yes, you know exactly where I'm going to start, don't you? Hurricane Lily, it's now pushing on into the Gulf of Mexico. Winds are increasing. We've got winds now at about 105 miles an hour. We could see a little bit more strengthening as well over the next 24 hours. It's still moving in roughly the same direction, west-northwest. It's actually moving quite quickly at about 15 miles an hour. Now, even though it's moving away from the west of Cuba, we could still see some heavy rains over the next few hours. And obviously, the winds could also still uh, have some impact. And then in terms of the direction it's heading and where we've got the hurricane, can watch well really stretching all the way from Galveston Island in Texas all the way across to the mouth of the Mississippi, Mississippi Valley. So as I say, that's something which obviously going to keep a very close eye on. It's a very strong system and could obviously do some very serious damage. Now then from there, elsewhere across uh, the United States, well, into Wednesday, apart from obviously the uh, ever-approaching storm, we've got pretty good conditions across much of the southeast, even down across much of Florida. We're just looking at scattered showers, scattered thunderstorms, some fairly active weather there on Wednesday, all the way along this frontal system across the central plains, heading on towards uh, the Great Lakes. Also a few showers likely later on towards uh, the northeast, not really quite reaching coastal areas. And then I must also tell you out across the west, now across the northern Rockies, we're going to see some fairly heavy amounts of snow, particularly to the mountains of Wyoming. And also some very strong winds Wednesday and Thursday across much of the southwest and to uh, California in particular. Still some heavy rains through Thursday across the central plains. And obviously by then all eyes will be on Lou, expected to make landfall perhaps early on Thursday. But of course we'll keep you well in the picture. Jonathan, back to you. Good afternoon from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. This is Space Shuttle Atlantis Launch Control. The countdown for launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis on this mission, STS-112, is continuing on schedule this afternoon. Launch is scheduled to occur at about 3.46 p.m. Eastern Time, and the launch opportunity window extends for about five minutes. Atlantis mission, STS-112, is the 15th shuttle mission in support of the International Space Station. This will be the 26th flight of Atlantis and the 111th space shuttle flight. Our main goal of this flight is to attach the S-1 truss segment to the International Space Station. This particular truss segment is 45 feet long and holds three radiators and much of the plumbing that will be needed to keep the entire station cool once additional modules and power generating solar arrays are added. Peter Sellers is one of our spacewalking astronauts on this flight. Theodore Yurchikin is on his first shuttle flight, and he is representing the Russian Space Corporation, Energia. Our pilot for today is Pam Melroy. And the crew is being commanded by Jeff Ashby on his third shuttle flight. 
Sandra Magnus is preparing for her first flight. And rounding out the crew is Dave Wolf, who spent 119 days on the Russian Mir space station, and he will also be conducting our EVAs on this flight. see our commander, Jeff Ashby, again preparing for his third flight. He also flew on STS-93 back in July of 99, a mission STS-100 in April of 2001. He's logged more than 400 hours in space. Moving down the line, our pilot, Pam Melroy. This will be her second space shuttle flight. She served as pilot on mission STS-92 back in October 2000. Mission Specialist Dave Wolf, medical doctor, will be making his third space shuttle flight on mission STS-112. He also flew on STS-58 in 93 and STS-86 in 97. And that was a mission that would begin a 119 stay on board the Mir space station. And he came back to Earth on mission STS-89 in January of 98. Moving across the room, Fyodor Yurchikin is a cosmonaut with the Russian Space Agency. And he will be serving as a mission specialist on this, his first space shuttle flight. Sandra Magnus, making her first space shuttle flight as a mission specialist. She joined NASA back in 1996 and worked in the astronaut office. She spent some time in Russia, working with the crews over there in the Mission Control Center in Russia. And relaxing is Pierre Sellers. He's uh, taking some time, as some of our astronauts do, just to relax and close their eyes as they anticipate our launch activities this afternoon. Coming down the third floor of the operations and checkout building here in KSC's industrial ever uh, industrial area, our astronauts uh, making their way to the elevators that will take them to the uh, ground floor, and then to the astrovan that will take them out to the launch pad. checkout building making their way to the astronaut van. Led by Commander Jeff Ashby, Pilot Pam Melroy, Mission Specialist Dave Wolf, Peter Sellers, Sandra Magnus, and Theodore Yorchikin. And at this point, our commander, Jeff Ashby, has made his way into the orbiter and is finding his seat on the flight deck of the vehicle. Uh, he'll be followed by our other astronauts who will be flying today, including pilot Pam Melroy and our four mission specialists, Dave Wolf, Sandra Magnus, Piers Sellers, and Theodore Yorchikin. This is a view of the mid-deck of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, and uh, our astronaut Dave Wolf has just climbed aboard his seat. View of Pam Melroy finding her way into her seat on the flight deck, her pilot seat, 
located next to the commander's seat. And now Sandra Magnus is shown here at the uh, White Room at the hatch of Atlantis as she is preparing to take her seat aboard the flight deck as well. And she will be the last astronaut to enter the vehicle. Atlantis OTC, comp checks on air to ground one. How do you read? CDR, loud and clear. CLT, MS-1. MS-2. MS-3. And attention all personnel, this is the NTD conducting a launch status check. Verify ready to resume count and go for launch. OTC? OTC is go. TBC? Tank and boosters are go. PTC? PTC is go. LPS? LPS go. Houston flight? Houston flight is go. Mila? And Mila is a go. STM? STM go. Safety console? Safety console is go. SPE? SPE is go. LRD? LRD go. SRO? SRO is go. You have range clear to launch. And CDR? CDR, Atlantis is go. I copy, and launch director, the launch team is ready to proceed. Copy that, NTD. Chief Engineer, launch director, verify no constraints to launch. Unit and team's ready to go, Mike. Okay, Charlie, thanks. KSC Safety Mission Assurance. Safety Mission Assurance is go, Mike. Copy, thank you. ISF launch manager. Mike, the NASA and Boeing space station team is go for launch. Okay, Bill, thanks. Range weather. Weather has no constraints for launch. Thank you, Kevin. And ops manager. Mike, the mission management team is working. No issues. You can continue the count. Okay, thank you. CDR launch director. Go ahead. Okay, Jeff, uh, Atlantis is ready for you. The weather is beautiful, and you guys have been in Florida far too long. So we wish you luck as you continue the assembly sequence on the International Space Station. Good luck. Thank you. You've done a great job of putting Atlantis and uh, the S-1 trust together. We thank you for your hard work. Now it's our turn. You got it. Have a great flight. And to do with that, you're clear to proceed. I copy. Thank you. And at this point, we do have the first view of our live external tank camera. This is what we call our ET cam. This view is taken from a color camera mounted on top of Atlantis external tank. We'll be taking a live feed from this camera from now through launch and until the shuttle separates from the external tank about 56 miles above the Earth. The camera, unique to this mission, will provide this view of the nose of the orbiter and a portion of the right-hand solid rocket booster and the external tank. The camera actually offers the mission and launch team an opportunity to monitor the shuttle's performance from an angle never before experienced. Half that clock will resume on my mark. Three, two, one, mark. And we are at T-minus nine minutes and counting as Atlantis is preparing for launch on shuttle mission SCS-112, less than nine minutes away at this point on a return mission to the International Space Station. The ground launch sequencer has been initiated. NASA test director Jeff Spalding is about to call for the transmittal of stored pre-launch commands.
T minus eight minutes and counting. Pilot Pam Melroy is flipping the switches in the cockpit to directly connect the three fuel cells to the essential power buses. And at this point, the orbiter access arm will be retracted away from the vehicle. This is the walkway used by the crew to gain entry into and out of the vehicle. OTC Jerry Goodson. T minus seven minutes and counting. Tucker and RF glitch will be working 27 volume 5, section 121, section 27B, inhibiting redundant switch on GPC AOI and payload A. Okay, copy SP entity, you concur with that? We concur. Okay, copy that. And uh, CLS, uh, please insert a hold at five. CLS copies. And LPSC, have a go to the seat. Can work. NTDSC, we don't... And LPSC, you need to hold a sign for this or can we work it on the fly? It's already working. Be done in 30, less than 30 seconds. CRPS, so we can complete our KP strip and chart recorders. And that's complete. Okay, LPS, uh, you report you are complete and are you in that configuration? Receiving signals from Mission Control in Houston. It's complete, and I have three great contacts. Be good, copy. And we have a go for auxiliary power unit start. Team has terminated liquid oxygen replenish to the external tank. The final purge sequence of the main engines is now underway. The primary objective of this shuttle mission is to rendezvous and dock with the orbiting International Space Station and to deliver the next piece of the truss segment to the station. T minus four minutes and counting. The final test of the flight control services will be conducted now. This is a program pattern of movements designed to verify the readiness for launch of the engines and other flight surfaces. Copy that. Coming up on final aer aero surface checks of the orbiter's wing elevons and rudder. It's being completed at this point. This verifies the orbiter's hydraulic systems. Also, next, the three main engines will be gimbaled as a final test prior to launch. T 
T-minus, three minutes and counting, and everything is looking good for launch this afternoon. All systems on board Atlantis are operating with no problems reported. Final pressurization of the liquid oxygen tank located inside the external tank is now underway. The next event will be the retraction of the gaseous oxygen vent hood as it's slowly retracted away from the top of the external tank. Real two copies in work. And everything continues to look good with the special to Atlantis. And we are at T-minus two minutes and counting. OTC, DLC, caution and warning, memory clear. Is complete, no unexpected messages. And Atlantis, OTC, close walking risers, 88, 02, hello. Give us a clear for ET, like two pressure, six. And out of traffic. All systems are go, and we are about 90 seconds from the launch of Space Shuttle Atlantis. One minute and counting. All looks good for launch of Shuttle Atlantis from Kennedy Space Center, Florida. T minus 50 seconds. And we are transferring to orbiter internal power at this time. Atlantis is now running off of its three onboard fuel cells. Coming up on a go for auto sequence start. And we have a go for auto sequence start. Atlantis's onboard computers have primary control of all the vehicle's critical functions. T minus 20 seconds and counting. 15 seconds. 13. 11. 9. 8. 7. 6. 5. We have both main engine start. 2. 1. Booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Atlantis, building the station and our future in space. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Roger roll, Atlantic. Atlantis into the roll, the external tank camera placing the shuttle in a heads down wing with wings level position for that eight and a half minute ride to orbit. The Florida Space Coast disappearing as uh, Atlantis moves into the correct azimuth for orbit. Thirty-three seconds into the flight, first condensation pouring over the top of the orbiter as the three liquid fuel main engines begin to throttle back in a three-step fashion to 72 percent of rated performance. Forty-nine seconds into the flight, Atlantis already two and a half miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, throttling up. Atlantis, you are go and throttle up. Roger. The throttle up call from Capcom Ken Ham, acknowledged by Commander Jeff Ashby, joined on the flight deck by pilot Pam Milroy, flight engineer Sandy Magnus, and mission specialist Pierce Sellers, Dave Wolf, and Russian cosmonaut Fyodor Yurchikin seated down on the mid deck. One minute, 20 seconds into the flight. This view from long range trackers at Playa Linda Beach, north of the Kennedy Space Center, and now the external tank camera view once again. Atlantis 11 and a half miles downrange, 17 miles in altitude, traveling 2,800 miles per hour. One minute, 45 seconds into the flight, about 20 seconds prior to solid rocket booster separation.
Booster officer reports a good solid rocket booster separation. Guidance now converging. Atlantis is on board computers commanding the main engine nozzles to gently swivel, aiming the shuttle for a precise target in space for main engine cutoff. Atlantis Houston, two engine towel. That call from Capcom Ken Ham acknowledged by Commander Jeff Ashby indicating that if one engine should fail, Atlantis can make a transoceanic abort uh, to Zaragoza, Spain. However, all three main engines continue to function normally. Two minutes, 50 seconds into the flight. Atlantis, 72 miles downrange, 47 miles in altitude, traveling almost 4,500 miles an hour. Atlantis flying on the singular power of its three liquid fuel main engines, which are draining about a half a ton of fuel per second from the shuttle's large external fuel tank. Three minutes, 30 seconds into the flight, Atlantis now 110 miles downrange, coming up on the point of negative return, where the shuttle will be too far downrange and too high an altitude to return to the launch site in the event of an engine failure. And that call up uh, confirming uh, that Atlantis uh, continues to head uphill. Capcom Ken Ham relaying that to Commander Jeff Ashby on board Atlantis. The orbiter and its six passengers on course and on time to reach the International Space Station on Wednesday. Atlantis now 176 miles downrange. All three main engines functioning perfectly, as are the three power producing fuel cells and the three auxiliary power units, four and a half minutes into the flight. The external tank camera was uh, smudged over by the propellant from the booster separation motors. We may not have a usable image for the remainder of the ascent. Press the ATO. That call up from Capcom Ken Ham indicating that we can make a minimal uh, abort to orbit targets, a minimal orbital insertion targets in the event of an engine failure. However, at the uh, five minute, 12 second mark into the flight, all three main engines continue to function normally. We should be rolling uh, to the heads-up position shortly, uh, enabling Atlantis to gain more favorable communications with the tracking and data relay satellite system shortly. Atlantis Houston, single engine, OPS-3. Atlantis, Roger. Five minutes, 50 seconds into the flight. Atlantis now 344 miles downrange from the Kennedy Space Center, almost 70 miles in altitude. Atlantis Houston, single engine, Zaragoza 104 and Prestonico. As Atlantis rolls to its heads-up position, uh, that call from Capcom Ken Ham indicating that we can make normal main engine cutoff targets in the event of an engine failure. However, all three main engines continue to function normally. Two minutes left in powered flight. Atlantis now 500 miles downrange, 66 miles in altitude, traveling at 12,000 miles an hour. Atlantis Houston, single engine press 104. 
That call from Capcom Ken Ham indicating that if two main engines should fail, we can still reach minimal orbital targets. However, all three main engines continue to function by the book at the 7 minute 15 second mark into the flight. Seven and a half minutes into the flight, Atlantis's main engines are once again being throttled down to limit the stress on the shuttle and its six crew members to that of three times the effect of gravity. Atlantis currently traveling at a speed of more than four miles per second. Atlantis almost 700 miles downrange, everything looking very good for an on-time main engine cutoff about 45 seconds from now. Eight minutes, five seconds into the flight of Atlantis, 780 miles downrange, standing by for main engine cut, which will be followed a few seconds later by the separation of the external fuel tank. Main engine cutoff confirmed by the booster officer here in Mission Control and normal ascent for Atlantis. And the booster officer reports a nominal separation of the external tank. Atlantis now moving away from its tank. We saw a nominal Nico, Holmes 1 not required. We saw L4D fail off, no action. Atlantis copy all, one six to That call from Capcom Ken Ham indicating a uh, failure of one of the small reaction control system jets on Atlantis that has no impact. So uh, after an on-time launch at 2.46 p.m. Central Time, 3.46 Eastern Time, Atlantis is now in its preliminary orbit an orbit of 141 by 36 statute miles, that orbit uh, to be raised and uh, refined into a higher elliptical orbit about uh, 45 minutes into the flight uh, through the firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines. This is Mission Control Houston here at the Johnson Space Center in the Space Shuttle Flight Control Room. The ASCEN team of flight controllers uh, watching over the initiation of the post-insertion timeline uh, for the crew on board Atlantis following a uh, normal and successful on-time launch from the Kennedy Space Center at 2.46 p.m. Central Time. Atlantis now in its preliminary orbit, an orbit to be refined uh, a little uh, while from now through the firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines that will increase Atlantis's altitude, basically beginning the chase to catch the International Space Station for a docking just before 10.30 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday. You can uh, see here in the shuttle flight control room, uh, the second uh, from your right of the console is Flight Director John Shannon, who presided over uh, this afternoon's launch of Atlantis to his left on the far right of your screen. 
Flight Director Steve Stitch, who was the uh, weather flight director, uh, monitoring all of the weather discussions throughout the course of the countdown. Uh, the second uh, from your left is Capcom Ken Ham, who uh, continues uh, to talk directly with the uh, astronauts on board Atlantis. And to his right, on the far left of your screen, astronaut Dwayne Carey, who uh, served as the weather Capcom uh, during the course of the countdown, talking directly to Chief Astronaut Charlie Precourt, who was flying weather reconnaissance in a shuttle training aircraft down at the Kennedy Space Center. Down the hall from the uh, Space Shuttle Flight Control Room, the International Space Station Flight Control Room continues to be uh, occupied as it is 24 hours a day, seven days a week around the clock. You can see uh, on console, uh, just now sitting down in his chair, Flight Director John McCullough, who has... We're watching, folks. John McCullough, the uh, flight director on console, has been working uh, throughout the uh, course of the day today with the Expedition 5 crew on board the International Space Station, Commander Valeri Korzun, NASA ISS Science Officer Peggy Whitson, and Flight Engineer Sergei Treschoff in their 124th day in space, their 122nd day on board the station. He'll be uh, relieved a short time from now by Flight Director Rick LeBrode, who is on the far right of your screen on his left. On the uh, far left of your screen is spacecraft communicator Ginger Carrick who uh, has been talking with the station crew throughout the course of the day. Again, uh, a successful launch for Atlantis uh, this afternoon. No issues reported as uh, the orbiter headed uphill. We uh, got about uh, three minutes of uh, spectacular video through the external tank camera mounted uh, on the liquid oxygen tank cable tray portion of the external tank as Atlantis left the launch pad, left the Florida Space Coast behind. Uh, unfortunately, after solid rocket booster separation, the camera was smudged over a bit by the propellant expended from the booster separation motors and was not uh, particularly usable after that. But uh, a unique view of Atlantis uh, in the initial stages of its climb to orbit. That orbit uh, now 143 by 37 statute miles, apogee to perigee. Uh, the altitude to be increased uh, through a firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines in what is known as the OMS-2 maneuver about 24 minutes from now. This is Mission Control Houston. We'll be uh, returning uh, the satellite uh, momentarily to the Kennedy Space Center for our complement of launch replays of Atlantis' uh, ascent to orbit, kicking off the fourth shuttle flight of the year and the 111th flight in shuttle program history. Included in that complement of launch replays will be a discrete uh, replay of the external tank camera from uh, launch through uh, just past solid rocket booster separation. Atlantis Houston for Pam, you are go for APU high shutdown. Copy, set in work.
This is Mission Control Houston. Again, uh, you're watching the initiation of our launch replays of uh, this afternoon's launch by Atlantis that occurred about 17 minutes ago. Atlantis launching on time from launch pad 39B at the Kennedy Space Center at 2.46 p.m. Central Time, 3.46 p.m. Eastern Time. The crew uh, on board Atlantis, Commander Jeff Ashby, Pilot Pam Melroy, and Mission Specialists Dave Wolf, Sandy Magnus, Pierce Sellers, and Fyodor Yurchikin in the early stages of their post-insertion timeline as they uh, check out Atlantis' systems, prepare to shut down the auxiliary power units, and uh, prepare for uh, a firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines less than 21 minutes from now to raise Atlantis' orbit and... Uh, begin the process that will culminate in the opening of the payload bay doors and a go for orbital operations from ASCEN Flight Director John Shannon here in Mission Control. The mechanical systems officer here in Mission Control reports a good shutdown of the auxiliary power units as Atlantis' astronauts continue through their post-insertion checklist. Ready for Ops 105. Bones, you have a go for Ops 105.
Headline of Houston, we see you in Ops 105 and Bones for your Ohms 2 burn setup. We plan to burn the onboard targets. Your TIG is 38 colon 40. 3840 with the onboard targets. Atlantis Houston, your go to load. This is Mission Control Houston, 24 and a half minutes into the flight of Atlantis. Uh, the orbiter in good shape as it passes over Spain on the first orbit of its mission, planned 11-day mission to the International Space Station for the docking plan just before 10.30 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday. That would put uh, our three spacewalks to install and activate the Starbird 1 or S-1 truss segment of the station on uh, Thursday, Saturday, and next Monday with an undocking on October 16th and a landing back at the Kennedy Space Center on Friday, October 18th. We're about 13 and a half minutes away from the firing of the orbital maneuvering system engines. This will be a, a one minute, three second firing of both orbital maneuvering system engines to uh, further raise Atlantis's orbit. It will remain in a highly elliptical orbit uh, throughout the course of its chase to reach the International Space Station which at the time of launch was traveling over the Pacific Ocean west of Ecuador. We are continuing our series of launch replays. Uh, shortly we'll be coming up on the discrete replay of the external tank camera, which provided uh, unprecedented views of Atlantis uh, looking down at the orbiter from uh, the top of the external tank uh, from launch uh, all the way through solid rocket booster separation before it was slightly smudged over by the propellant from the booster separation motors.
loud and clear. Okay, we're uh, putting MCS power down ISO and work in GH2 inerting. Copy, thanks. We're watching. And Bones, you're go to maneuver. Continuing the uh, launch replays, about to uh, have the discrete view of the external tank camera from liftoff uh, through SRB separation. While you continue to watch uh, this uh, isolated view from the external tank camera of Atlantis' launch about 32 minutes ago, pilot Pam Melroy on board Atlantis reporting that um, the external tank umbilical doors have now been closed, part of the post-insertion timeline procedures for the crew on board. We're less than six minutes away from firing the orbital maneuvering system engines on board Atlantis and the so-called Ohms 2 burn which uh, will increase Atlantis's altitude, and in essence, in of itself, a rendezvous burn that will continue to propel Atlantis toward the International Space Station and a docking just before 10.30 a.m. Central Time on Wednesday.
35 minutes into the flight of Atlantis here in Mission Control, the Ascent uh, team of flight controllers led by Flight Director John Shannon continue to watch over the crew as they uh, continue in their post-insertion timeline, having uh, closed and latched the external tank umbilical doors, having uh, previously shut down the auxiliary power units, which functioned perfectly en route to orbit, as did Atlantis's main engines, and as are its power-producing fuel cells, as we prepare for the firing of the uh, orbital maneuvering system engines once again, just over three minutes from now, this will be a one minute, three second firing of both uh, Ohm's engines uh, to increase Atlantis's altitude and uh, further propel it toward the International Space Station. Yeah, Atlantis, the uh, first stage was nothing short of spectacular. Uh, however, it appears that at uh, SRB-7, the uh, camera picked up maybe some sort of debris maybe associated with the motors, and uh, the rest of the footage was fairly obscured, sort of a, a foggy kind of a view. And did you see Pam waving? We're going to rerun the video and see if we can find that. Roger, thanks for the report. Good afternoon. Welcome to our STS-112 post-launch news conference. We have with us NASA Administrator Sean O'Keefe, and he will be making some opening statements before we go to your questions. And might make one note here. We're, we are local in this room only. We're having a little bit of satellite switching problems and we'll replay this, this uh, event later on. Mr. Keith? Well, good afternoon. Uh, first of all, this is my continuing practice of being the warm-up act from Michael Einbach. So when he comes in, can give you the real story of what occurred during the launch. But I think uh, just as a preview of coming attractions, uh, he will tell you that this was an absolutely extraordinary uh, clean launch, as the, the launch control folks like to refer to it. Uh, because of all the diligence and effort that went into this previously. It's a big deal for NASA as well, particularly, given the fact that it's a uh, has been so many months now since our last launch in June, uh, as a consequence of the diligence on the part of quality control inspectors, particularly in this case David Strait and uh, his colleagues from USA who were examining and, and inspecting uh, the, the orbiters, particularly in this case of his Atlantis, that he discovered the first uh, fuel line crack. And I believe there's some copies here of um, the actual piece, of, if uh, Glenn will pass them around here, uh, of the segment that actually is the shot of the fuel line crack that David found. And so as a consequence, if you're not looking real carefully, you wouldn't see this. It is a hairline fracture and something that, again, is a tremendous testimonial to the fact that here's a, a gent who took his job so seriously, and so many of the folks who were associated with the NASA community, he's just a representative sample of exactly the diligence uh, towards safety of, of operations and mission assurance kind of focus that we always have. And so if you look at this thing, you really got to look really carefully to see it. More importantly, uh, once it was uh, a correction was, was determined and what the appropriate uh, welding procedure would be to repair the fuel line cracks. Uh, there were several discussions that I was party to as part of the flight randomness review that was conducted a little over two weeks ago uh, in preparation for this launch. 
in which it was extremely difficult for anybody to determine what the area was that was actually treated. So, you know, the, the attention to detail was extraordinary. The focus on the, on the question was uh, uh, clearly a further indication of, of the safety ethos that we live and breathe every day in this agency uh, to assure that operations are conducted as safely as we know how to do it. And so as a consequence, uh, uh, this is just yet another example of the extraordinary commitment to that uh, important culture that uh, can be demonstrated. And it's something you got to really, uh, again, look very carefully to see what the consequence of it would be uh, in order to see where the, where the problem would, would result. You know, again, this is also a case where uh, the, the, uh, the concern was that to the extent that there was any, any uh, uh, further fracturing, uh, any fragments that would occur as a result of uh, continuing um, pressure here would then create uh, a potential challenge or problem on uh, any of the launches that would be coming up if any of this foreign object damage uh, would, were to result as a consequence during a launch. But it, again, it is a, it's an illustration of the, the attention to detail and the focus on safety that continues to, to dominate here that even something which would appear to be as insignificant as that uh, is something that we stop the procedures, make sure we understand what the consequences are, and make a determination on how to, how to repair it uh, before letting any prospect at all occur of what we could, you know. There's no one in the organization who ever at any point during the course of a launch or thereafter who would sit back and say, gee, I wish I had said something. That's never going to happen in this agency. And as a result, the focus and attention to this is so important. Second example of this, which occurred, which was widely reported, covered by an awful lot of the journalists here in this room, uh, was the deficiencies with the crawler, uh, the, the, the transporter, the, the means that's used to bring the, the orbiter from the VAB to the launch pad. And it travels at this you know, breakneck speed of uh, one mile per hour. And uh, as it moves its way across, uh, the, uh, the, the, the crushed gravel here at uh, KSC lining up towards either of the two launch pads. Well, one of the widely reported de developments there was that there was some, uh, in something in, in around 20 different bearings that were fractured inside the, the two crawlers that we use. Um, and in sitting through that flight readiness review, I got a rundown of how that activity was dealt with within a matter of weeks after that was identified and the problems were, were noticed, uh, the bearings that we determined they were manufactured by a little uh, a division of Ingersoll Rand in North Carolina, an outfit called the Shiloh plant, and they actually found one of the guys who was involved in the foundry activity 35 years ago when the bearings were first manufactured. They pulled out the drawings and duplicated made bearings for the crawlers in a span of no more than three or four weeks. And it's just an amazing effort that they put up and dealt with over the course of a couple of shifts every day for about three or four weeks to produce the bearings. All the bearings on the, on the crawler were replaced before the orbiter was transported out, the Atlantis in this case. And yet it took until that flight readiness review for somebody to say, well, I wonder how long that particular set of cracked bearings were in the crawler. And the conclusion is it was probably, in all likelihood, given all the physical evidence, there since the last Saturn V was transported to a launch pad. So for the better part of 25, 30 years, you know, this has been a deficiency that, that was now found, corrected with great diligence, and again, another example of the effort that we go through that anything that you come across, any time, no matter whether it just cropped up yesterday or has been there for a while, the mindset in this agency from everyone who's associated with the activities is to assure we do it right, do it properly, and do it as safely as we know how to do it uh, to assure for that. And so each and every time there's a delay in any of the launches here as a consequence of this, we make absolutely no apology whatsoever uh, for that. Because it, and while it may be an inconvenience, and we certainly understand the challenges it is of covering these important events, it nonetheless is because of that ethos it's so important. So for that, I want to thank you for your perseverance and patience in, uh, in waiting for this launch to occur. It's been a while coming, but it's one that, for all the right reasons, we've taken our time to make sure it's done right. And I uh, look forward to seeing you at the next launch in November when we continue on this 
important journey to build the International Space Station to something I think we're all going to be proud of. Thank you. Let me just open it up to comments and questions. Can we start with Miles or Brian? Hey, Miles. How are you? Sorry to change the subject. Uh, question about the uh, Soyuz production line, reports out of Russia, that uh, the Russians can no longer continue to support the station, or at least that's the indication. What have you heard directly from the Russians? And uh, what options are you contemplating, considering the possibility of not keeping the station tended continuously? No, neither me, we or uh, Rosavia Cosmos, the, the Russian space agency, are entertaining such a notion. It has been in continuous operation with a permanent presence aboard for almost now two years, coming up on the second anniversary here next month. And our full intention is we're going to continue in that pattern uh, for as far as anybody can imagine is a continuous presence 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 a year, we're going to be aboard International Space Station. Now, what I understand has occurred is uh, uh, Energia company that uh, has been uh, involved in the activities of Blink Soyuz and Progress have notified um, so our folks as well as Rosavia Cosmos, the Russian space agency, of what they believe to be financial difficulties. And uh, the Russian space agency spokesman, as I understand it, and from all the uh, deputy uh, director of, uh, of Rosavia Cosmos, uh, has articulated that it is not their intention whatsoever to, uh, to, to shut down or to withdraw from uh, the partnering arrangements that have been uh, continued uh, for, again, these continuously for the last two years and for the time ahead. We anticipate they will uh, continue to send two Soyuz uh, flights per year for uh, the rotating crew rescue vehicle capacity as well as uh, the continued progress flights, of which they just sent one up here just recently, and we'll continue to do that uh, again in the time ahead uh, to continue to support uh, the International Space Station operations. We don't see any change there. Are they having financial difficulties? I think clearly that's been signaled, and uh, it is something they're going to have to work through, and we're continuing to monitor the situation. But beyond that, we don't anticipate any withdrawal from that partnering arrangement. Uh, in the back, John Wall. Mike Cabbage, Orlando Sentinel. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mr. Thank you. Um, my question is on uh, security. It's more than a year since 9-11 now, and many of the restrictions on the release of information surrounding the launch and the countdown um, that were put on the shuttle program in the wake of 9-11 are still in place. And I've got a two-part question. First, have you had any serious and credible threats against the shuttle? since 9-11, and if not, when might we see some of these restrictions um, start to be eased? Well, uh, I'm not going to comment on the first part, because in and of itself, uh, you know, that's just, it, that would further fuel uh, the interest on the part of anybody who'd like to make a big statement. And that's essentially what's involved here. This is a high visibility, high value target. There's only four of these on the planet. And so as a consequence, that becomes a great way to make a statement if somebody wants to really do something profound. And to be sure, in the wake of 9-11, all of the very highly visible kinds of assets, Golden Gate Bridge, you know, Sears Tower, you name it, any of those kinds of examples are the kinds of things that, and assets that uh, certainly have a visibility and a significance and a symbolism to them that we are very attentive to. So the last thing we want to do is, by our inattention, uh, make it a more attractive alternative. And so I can assure you that uh, our intention is to maintain the security procedures, uh, assure that that, that not become a, uh, um, a condition in which uh, anybody can decide this would be a wonderful idea to make a, a statement uh, and to try to gain our attention in that regard. And moreover, it is something that clearly has a, a volatility to it, given the fact we're looking at an awful lot of fuel sitting there that's a very high value uh, target as well as a very volatile asset in that case. And so leaving it as an exposed condition in this period since September 11th is not the most prudent course. I don't see a change in those security procedures in time ahead. Questions? Yes, sir. Chris Vault with Aviation Week. Uh, a question on crew transfer rescue vehicle. Could you provide an update on where you are with CTRV um, 
especially whether you're looking at headquarters perhaps to form a, a new dedicated office of sorts for CTRV studies and maybe development. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm not planning a headquarters operation to do that, per se. Uh, we are looking at, as I've talked about several times uh, in public testimony, uh, as well as other you know, venues here, a discussion of looking at a crew transfer vehicle that would accomplish the objectives of a rescue vehicle capacity or return vehicle requirement. Um, Part of what was the concern, I think, with the previous assets that we had developed, X-38s very specifically, uh, was its limited mission purpose. And as a consequence, it, it, we could not see a, um, a delivery of the asset prior to uh, very late 2008, early 2009. And the best anybody could guess, and I emphasize the word guess, is it would cost somewhere between two and a half and three and a half billion dollars. Now that's not good enough, so we've got to have a little more certainty that to that, and we have to have uh, a, a lot more definition to what various assets could provide for a crew transfer vehicle requirement, as well as the rescue vehicle and, or return vehicle uh, kind of uh, capabilities that would pose some different operational conditions, but at the same time, you know, meet multiple objectives. And we think we can do something like that in around that same rough time frame uh, within a year or two. And so as a consequence, let's be more expansive about it. And that's something we're, we're continuing to work on. We're down to the point of selecting uh, what is the most viable, the best alternative uh, design for that particular mission approach. And uh, I suspect in the very short time ahead, we'll be looking at uh, how to proceed on that program. Okay. Yes, sir. Phil Chen. Hi, Phil. Hi, Sean. I'm Phil Chen, uh, Earth News. Um, I saw your ceremony a couple weeks ago where you promoted Peggy Christen uh, to the science officer. I hope you sent a pointed ears with the uh, promotion. <laughs> um, what does this mean? Uh, what new responsibilities, uh, functions does she have, or is this just a label? How will she be integrating with the scientific community with her new responsibilities? Mm -hmm. Well, it is a couple of advantages here. first one is that she is uh, I mean, eminently qualified. Uh, given her, her background, uh, and I think focus as a, as a research and scientific community expertise that she has to begin with. And I think it's an important effort to recognize the transition from what has largely been an engineering project leading up to this point, uh, a building International Space Station, and will continue on for the next you know, several years as we see this built out to the configuration uh, that will be informed by what the research and science agenda can provide for us. Uh, but I think it's an important symbol, you know, not just symbolic effort, but very uh, substantive one that recognizes we're transitioning from largely an engineering project to a scientific operations objective, uh, which will, on every flight, on every mission, incorporate a very ambitious scientific agenda. Um, uh, Mike Bloomfield, uh, the commander of STS-110, uh, today in the, in the mission briefing that he provided, uh, ended his discussion by providing a very specific commentary about what kind of advantages can be drawn from station by a more concerted focus and attention to research and scientific objectives, and how our imaginations are the only limit to what we can yield from this marvelous, remarkable uh, facility that is uh, that gives us the gold standard, if you will, uh, for microgravity condition we couldn't possibly duplicate here on Earth. So, in many ways, she will be the first of many uh, of every flight, every single mission, every expedition. We'll always have an individual, an officer aboard who is responsible for the scientific content what's involved. And what she's helping us do right now, Peggy, is not only conducting the activities of the science objectives on the, the expedition today but also you know, essentially writing the job description of the kinds of things that need to be emphasized of where we could really get more mileage out of the asset for the science and research objectives and areas where we ought to be you know, focused more specifically towards the kind of things that uh, uh, the science utilization team that we asked to come up with a prioritization set could show us the way in terms of how to use the, the asset as well. So it's just more of the evolution, I think, of evolving from an engineering effort to one that's really an operational lab that will be dedicated to science and research objectives. And its ultimate configuration will be informed 
by what those research requirements are. Yes, sir. Mr. Dunn. Randy Siegel, WSTU. Are we saying that we will not be in a position to increase any crew size in order to get the most science out of the station until the 208, 209 time frame? Are no, we talking? No, no, not at all. No, no, no. Absolutely not. Please get that, erase that from your mind instantly. What is intended is to build the crew size to what will be required by the science and research objectives on whatever date that occurs. And as it stands right now, the objective was never to expand the crew size beyond its present configuration until at least 2006. Right? So moving in the direction of looking at what configuration may require a crew expansion beyond present configuration uh, to maximize the science. And that's part of what one of the great advantages now really focusing on what do we need to, to, to do in terms of the, the science objectives, always having an astronaut aboard who is proficient and focused on utilizing and maximizing the science we can draw from this, being informed by the priority and utilization efforts that the REMAP team, I'm sure you're familiar with, came up with in their efforts to look at what all the science objectives would be. That ultimately is going to tell us what the size of the crew and ultimate configuration of space station ought to be in order to meet those science and research objectives. And whether that's in 06 or any year beyond that, we'll see. In the meantime, there's a number of different operational manner or approaches we could do in order to maximize the crew size beyond that, if need be. Just to follow up, are we sure. saying, you're telling me that the time, the science is driving yes, sir. the crew. Absolutely. What time do you intend to have the science in place so we can see when the incremental? Uh, boy, when I, when I get the answer to that, I can't wait to share it with you, OK? Um, I don't know. We've just completed the maximization and prioritization task force efforts. This is a collection of every uh, official in the scientific community representing every discipline, everybody's fondest expectations of what we can accomplish on station. Having them assemble and actually pick a number from one through some other higher succession that says, here's the prioritization pace you ought to take on in this objective. Until then, before they got together in March and finished their report in July, Everything was number one, which therefore meant nothing was number one. And the expectations far exceeded what we could ever could produce or, for that matter, were of common caliber, whereas some of the scientific objectives were nowhere near comparable to each other, didn't rise to the same level of, of, uh, of importance. And so now we've got a prioritization set, and we can build out the capacity to meet that. One thing we can, we can be sure of is, in March, February to March of 2004, the core configuration must be complete by that date in order to make any configuration beyond that possible. Next step from there is international partner components. It's going to, and that's the Columbus from ESA, from the European Space Agency, uh, the uh, the centrifuge from the from the NASDA and the Japanese uh, space agency that has have contributed that particular asset. And it continues. There are a number of components and modules that will continue to be deployed in that span that will take us another year to year and a half. Another arm, manip uh, manipular, um, or a manual arm uh, device that the Canadian Space Agency has done. All those over the course of the next two to three years after we achieve core configuration will then help us look at any configuration beyond that that's informed by the science objectives. That's where we're going. So as soon as we get there, can't wait to share it with you. Marsha. Marsha Dunn, Associated Press. Hi. Um, hi. I'm, I'm wondering, we, we almost came close in a couple of weeks of seeing a young pop star launch into space. And there's reports uh, of the Russians perhaps entertaining the idea of having uh, contests, game shows, talk stuff, uh, reality series. And I'm wondering, would NASA even entertain the notion of sending a uh, game show winner into space aboard, uh, even if it was aboard a Soyuz, into the space station. Has there been any approach by the Russians to you about this subject? And is it even too outlandish uh, for NASA to consider? First of all, I think we, as a consequence of, of uh, several uh, of the previous flights in which uh, non-astronauts, non-cosmonauts trained in the activity. We 
as a result of those flights, we've reached a very clear agreement with all of our international partners that are associated with the International Space Station, 16 nations combined in our efforts to really realize this remarkable capacity, to develop what are minimum standards necessary in order to be engaged and around during the operational conduct of any flight. As it pertains to our preference, this is serious business. Every single flight is, no question, something that is just not to be trifled with. The attention to detail that I talked about at the beginning is there because the stakes are so high. After every one of these launches, I have a, the, the real privilege of spending time with the families of all the crew members while you know, they're just having just launched. And there's not a single time that I've done that, I haven't thought to myself, we owe them at a minimum everything we can do every single day as far as we can do it in order to assure that the people that they care the most about who have volunteered to be part of this activity are conducting operations the safest way and we know how. But they all know what the stakes are and they know what the consequences are. And you know, if there's any doubt about that, you talk to you know, Dan Bursch or Carl Waltz who came off the last expedition, spent 196 days up there, the longest U.S. record. There's some consequences there. Their physical condition is different than what it was before they left. This is not something that's, that's been lighthearted. And so as a consequence, the, the focus we really have a, 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 a view to is to assure proficiency. And we would invite anybody, anybody from any discipline who has got the interest, the wherewithal, the passion to want to be part of this program to go through all the, the training efforts that are required in order to maintain that proficiency and to make them contributors not folks who are just there to avoid standing, you know, getting in the way of the work. And so as a result, we, we maintain a very uh, specific standard in the astronaut corps, the cosmonaut corps, maintain a level of proficiency and come from disciplines that are as wide as you could ever imagine. There are all kinds of different backgrounds of folks that are engaged in the astronaut corps today. The old days of this being just for the you know, for the test pilots who eat dirt in the California and Nevada deserts and all that stuff, those days are over. We are now looking at a very wide, wide-ranging set of disciplines and backgrounds and professions from which people come from. But they do share the same thing in common, which is a very strong sense of proficiency uh, and an understanding of operational activities and have spent a lot of years training for every one of those flights in order to make sure they're contributors. Uh, in doing so. They also share the requirement, I should say, they share the common denominator of also being extremely humble. It's one of the most remarkable characteristics I've seen in all of every, every astronaut and cosmonaut. Some of the most humble people you ever want to meet. And part of it's because they understand what the challenge is that they're confronting and the consequences are. So we're glad to take anybody who wants to step up to that. We have time for one final question from Jay Barbary at NBC. Mr. O'Keefe, uh, speaking, how are you doing? Speaking for all the old test pilots that ate dirt in California. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, how do you envision when you want to increase your science missions and crews on the current configuration? How do you envision supporting them up there? A couple of Soyuz parked at the same time. How are you going to do that? Oh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, and, and all of which are, are under consideration trying to think of how we're going to do it. Um, in addition to the stock approach of saying let's use Soyuz capsules in some number you know, or support whatever crew configuration you have, again, driven by the science. Another is to look at uh, uh, extended duration orbiter missions. Uh, right now, we've, almost every mission is uh, roughly 11 to 17 days, depending on the circumstances. Rarely do we see an extension beyond that. There's at least ample reason to believe we might get a little more extended time out of each of those. Uh, there are opportunities in which you can use the orbiter as a return capacity or a transfer capacity instead of, there's a bunch of different procedures that can be employed to look at this. Uh, in addition to accelerating and stepping up the activity of developing a crew transfer vehicle. And so to the extent that we're able to do that, uh, that meets an awful lot of the objectives we're after. But there are several permutations of this approach uh, that don't necessarily need to call for one stock solution set that says uh, here's how the, how the, the what the uh, vehicle would be of choice. Okay. okay, that will conclude this. Jim Halsell, 
Shuttle Program Launch Integration Manager, and Mike Leinbach, the Shuttle Launch Director. And we'll begin with opening remarks from them, and then we'll take your questions. Jim? Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, just a magnificent launch. As the administrator just said a few minutes ago, it's particularly satisfying given the number of months that we've been working on some uh, uh, some issues that had to be dealt with before we could continue flying with total safety. Uh, so for the, the team here, and in fact, the entire Space Shuttle program team, it was satisfying to see that vehicle get on orbit and get us back in business going to and from the International Space Station. When I came from the, uh, from the uh, Launch Control Center, the only issue I was aware of as of about an hour ago uh, was uh, L4D. That's one of the down-firing uh, thrusters located in the left rear uh, RCS section, remote, uh, Reaction Control System jet, uh, failed right after main engine cutoff when it was first called upon uh, to help us control attitude. Uh, no particular difficulty in the sense that uh, the redundancy management automatic system sensed that that jet wasn't building up pressure in the allotted time, uh, so it, it declared that jet failed so the control could be handed over to one of the other two backup jets on that pod firing in that direction. Uh, so this is not an unusual or unheard of event. Uh, jet failures are something that we, uh, we continue to work with to uh, decrease the, uh, the occurrence. Uh, so we consider that a minor failure at the current time and not one that will impact the success of the mission in any way whatsoever. Uh, so over to you, Mike, for details of the countdown. Okay, thanks, Jim. Well, it was a beautiful, beautiful launch today. We were talking the weather a little bit during the countdown, but it all worked out perfectly well, and it was a, it was a gorgeous day in Central Florida to launch. We worked uh, just enough issues during the countdown to keep the team sharp. Uh, a couple of things of note, we did have a red crew that we sent in about uh, two hours away from launch to change to uh, change out some uh, circuit breakers, some fuses on circuit breakers uh, that had blown on ground power supply system to our uh, NPS research pumps, the main propulsion system recirculation pumps. And that was on a redundant system, but we wanted to make sure we had that, that redundant power capability should the primary system fail, uh, which it didn't, it never failed, but we did regain our redundancy there via that red crew. We had a report, uh, uh, several reports during the morning about uh, the Eastern Range and, and one of their uh, command systems uh, lost part of their part of their capability. That's a, a dual uh, system over there. Each system has two strings on it, so they actually have four systems, four strings that are capable of performing the function, and they had three out of the four available at T0. It made one of the two complete systems mandatory, and that system stayed intact perfectly fine, so they were go. No issue there. And then shortly after liftoff, uh, we had a ground instrumentation failure, which prevented our ground launch sequencer from safing the, uh, the various systems in the control room. Again, that was after T0, and uh, we got through that via manual safing, which we practiced uh, numerous times in our launch countdown simulations. So other than that, uh, it was a beautiful day for a launch, and we feel really good right now. Okay, thanks, Mike. Let's go to the questions. Um, Bill? Uh, Bill Harris, CBS. Mike, is that instrumentation probably the same thing that we were talking about earlier about the SRB hold down post instrumentation uh, that was lost? Yes, it's related to that. Uh, we had all eight hold down post uh, pyrotechnic charges fire perfectly fine. That's, those commands are sent by the vehicle itself. That all worked perfectly fine. And as part of that sequencing of those commands, our ground launch sequencer in the control room is looking for two signals that we've actually lifted off. As soon as we reached T0 and the SRBs ignited, we had a failure of a, of a HIM card, it's called. It's a hardware interface module, essentially an, an integrated circuit card, we believe failed. We'll have to go out to the pad and verify that, but all instrumentation seems to point that way. So we had a failure of, a, of an integrated circuit card right at liftoff, and that prevented one of the two commands that our ground launch sequencer is looking for to verify liftoff, and that prevented the ground launch sequencer from going through our safing activity. So what you heard on net was GLS was holding, uh, and that was true. Uh, we had to issue the safing commands to our liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen systems and other systems manually as opposed to letting the firing room control them uh, on the computer. It's a quick follow because I just don't understand. I realize it's obviously it's not a big deal because all the posts fired. Um, it's a timing issue. Obviously, if that card had failed, I'm assuming it has taken earlier, we wouldn't have launched. I'm assuming it would have shut the engines down and you guys would have been sitting there. If it, if it turns out to be a, a total card failure, as we suspect, uh, and had that failed prior to liftoff, yes, it would have held us on the ground. There are other parameters that are, that are monitored through that, that card, 
uh, that are critical that we need to, to have up and running prior to the liftoff. So had it failed prior to, to, to T0, we would have failed, yes, if it turns out to be that card itself. Any other questions? Okay. Front row, Craig. Uh, Craig Cabal Aviation Week, not to beat it to death, but if you'd have had a, a pad abort uh, in a car that failed in the middle of the RSLS abort, would it have had any effect? No. Again, we practice these type of failures so often in our launch countdown simulations that uh, uh, we got through uh, today. We would have gotten through an on-pad abort just as safely as we got through the safing that we did. We, we practice it so often that it's almost second nature to us. In fact, our next launch countdown simulation will be dedicated to just those on-pad aborts uh, because we have changed the procedures very, very slightly, but we want to make sure that the changes we put into the procedures uh, are executed properly. So we, we dedicate a heck of a lot of time and, and engineering talent to those, those full-day simulations, making sure we know what has to happen, when it has to happen. Okay, Chris, right here, second row. Hi, Chris Kreidler from Florida today. Uh, Back to the heater we talked a lot about yesterday. I heard something a little different this morning from what I thought I heard yesterday, which was there were sort of two controllers at issue and one wasn't functioning correctly and one was. Can you talk about what you determined today about that heater? Uh, the story should not have changed with respect to the failure. The failure, uh, our understanding of it was solid yesterday and what I tried to convey to you that time uh, uh, hasn't changed. What was the big incoming news, if you will, is um, from the time that we had our L-1 and the time that I was able to brief you yesterday, the engineering community had a chance to rally and do some uh, outstanding research and analysis and uh, go back through our records and we were able to find a 1987 test that specifically tested the kind of conditions that we were worried about, uh, which was this heater, which was now controlling to a secondary set point, 250 degrees instead of the, um, uh, the lower 170 or so value, what, what if it were to suffer the next smart failure, if you, if you will, the one that would, uh, would turn it on permanently and the temperature would go up to a much higher value? Would the vehicle suffer any damage or the surrounding components or would we lose any functionality in that line that is an inability to relieve water overboard? Uh, we found 1987 test data that tested exactly that condition where they intentionally uh, turned the heater on permanently, let it stabilize at its highest temperature uh, for a significant uh, extended period of time, and they proved, in fact, that there was no uh, damage to the components of the relief line or the surrounding uh, components in the vehicle to include the, the thermal protection system and the seals on the outer mold line. So with that data in hand that I didn't have yesterday, that allowed us to go forward with confidence that uh, we can consider that, that, that heater system and, in fact, that entire relief line, which remembers the tertiary, the third of uh, three independent ways of relieving the fuel cells of water, completely functional. Uh, so that, uh, that story came together at 8 p.m. last night. It was briefed uh, again at the tanking meeting this morning to the entire audience, and everybody felt comfortable to launch as is. Okay, thanks. Stephanie? I'm going to put it down for the mechanics. Six or seven minutes before liftoff, we heard that you were talking about holding the count at T minus five. Can you tell us what uh, that was about? Uh, yeah, that was very similar to a problem we had on uh, a mission about three or four missions ago, where we we ended up launching with 11 seconds left in the window. Uh, it was a, it was an identical um, uh, signature that we had today. Uh, what got us to be able to, to clear that problem so quickly this time, it was an it was uh, RF glitch, radio frequency glitch. It occurs as the orbiter access arm is retracting away from the vehicle. And the commands, the, uh, the vehicle parameters, part of the vehicle monitoring system we're, we're seeing through uh, radio frequency transmission from the orbiter, not, not through a hard line data path through the ground systems, but actually RF radiation. And when the orbiter access arm retracts, occasionally, depending on the, on the atmospheric conditions along with the OAA, you can get these glitches in the signal. So it was an identical um, uh, signature to what we had three or four flights or so ago. We were able to clear it this time much more quickly because after we had that glitch last time, we went back to the procedure that we used for that and, and tuned up the procedure, found some things in the procedure that we could uh, uh, not 
that we didn't have to perform. And so you saw the, the very same fault cleared in, in uh, probably a minute or so today where it took us uh, seven or so minutes last time. And we cleared it, and we get, verified a good load prior to picking up the count at five, so we, we did not have to hold. We would have held at five had we not cleared that problem. Okay, and I'm assuming you watch the onboard camera views from a long to the point, especially when the uh, picture disappeared. Was that uh, in fact related to the motors separating the boosters from the shuttle, just uh, smudging up the uh, the lens, or what? That is certainly our 99.7% uh, uh, guess at the current time that the uh, the timing was such that uh, we lost visibility from the camera or it became blurred uh, right at uh, what should have been booster separation ignition motor time. And that plays into pre-flight we had understood that the placement of that camera in relation to the booster plumes made it susceptible uh, to incurring uh, some some deposits from the booster separation motor onto the lens. Uh, we did not have a, a complete understanding of how bad or how good the resulting picture might be thereafter. I know that uh, several of us had had conversations who had flown before and we understood that with the time of day of launch and the azimuth that we were launching at, that would put the sun somewhere back uh, behind the camera, possibly in the field of view, and that's exactly the kind of situation when you're on orbit after you've had booster separation motor exhaust plume deposits on the windows, it's looking through the windows and into the sun uh, that you get that uh, that milky effect, which is exactly what we seem to, uh, that we saw today. So uh, we're going to we're gonna go back and, and review the tapes and make sure the timing confirms the story that I just gave you. But it was not totally unexpected. Uh, I must say that prior to that point in time, uh, I'm sure you all share my opinion that those views were just spectacular. And it was, uh, it would, uh, it's the next best thing to, to actually be on board. And in some ways, you get a view you never have even if you are on board. And the image was kind of uh, fuzzy, especially toward the end, uh, right as the ET was separating. At uh, one point, uh, I thought I saw the shuttle actually moving, moving away. Was that what we were looking at, or was it just my imagination? Yeah, I think so. After booster separation and the haze, we believe, was deposited on the, uh, on the camera at that point in time, uh, I really couldn't tell anything for a while. Uh, but then at about Mach 15, I feel fairly certain that I was able to see the horizon turn as the vehicle made its uh, roll the heads up. I was looking at Miko and also during the replays of Miko, trying to see exactly what we could see, and most of us could discern some motion of the uh, uh, of the shuttle moving away from the uh, from the external tank, and that's all the way it should have worked. And that's uh, maybe on a different day, even with the same deposit of booster separation motor exhaust in the lens, but not looking into the direction of the sun. Uh, it might be exactly as it is for the crew looking through windows. If you're not looking into the sun, the deposits are not nearly as as troublesome. Thank you. Bill? Phil Chen Earth, Mr. Mark Leinbach. Uh, can you outline us uh, what's happening this week on both uh, Columbia and Endeavor? Uh, when will Columbia be back at the state it was back in uh, June of when the, the um, slow liner cracks were first detected? And uh, what date are you bookmarking right now for uh, Endeavor's rollout? Well, we're, uh, we're targeting uh, uh, next week for Endeavor's rollout. I can't give you the specific date right now. Um, as far as Columbia goes, and everything else on Endeavor is looking good for its November mission. Uh, completely right on track for the November mission. Columbia, we should have gotten into the welding on the flow liners today. And frankly, I had other things on my mind, so I didn't, uh, I didn't check on those guys today. Uh, but we were set up to begin the welding today, and I'll, I'll check on that tonight. And that would be a fairly easy uh, uh, fix to those flow liners. A little bit different material, of course, than on Atlantis and Endeavor, but we feel we have a good handle on it. Okay, uh, let's go over here to Mike Cabbage. Mike Cabbage with the Orlando Sentinel. I have another um, tank camera question. Um, what future plans do you have for um, flying additional cameras on the tank, and are we likely to see one on Endeavor next month? Uh, no, the, uh, at the current time, we don't have the camera net and tested on any specific future flights. We don't have the opportunity to get it on board, even if we wanted to, the, uh, the near-term flights. Uh, we do have, uh, uh, we did make a buy, as I remember, of three or four additional cameras that we have in stock, and we would be able, if called upon and if manifested, 
to integrate those into the external tank. Uh, so we have the opportunity, but at the current time, we don't have the requirement to do so. Do you have any sort of ballpark idea on when we might see the next um, flight with one? I, I think my answer to you right now is that the camera is not manifested on any future flight. Any other questions? And the first movement of the starboard door of the uh, payload bay doors uh, beginning to swing open uh, the earth below as Atlantis uh, currently orbiting over the southwestern United States at an altitude of 143 statute miles at its apogee, 98 statute miles at its perigee.